I've tried four serial killers in my life. He is the worst of the worst. After killing six-year-old Nathan, he would then kill seven-year-old Eli, eight-year-old Mara, two-year-old Gabe, and one-year-old Elaine. My babies, my babies. Timothy appeared stone-faced and unemotional. I impose a sentence of death. The following stories tell the tale of three sadistic murderers getting death sentences, all while being captured on courtroom footage to be seen by all. By all. We begin tonight in Lexington County as the sentencing phase of the Timothy Ray Jones Jr. trial continues. His family members told the jury today they don't want him put to death for the murders of his five children. At one point, Jones Sr. removed his shirt to show a tattoo portrait he had of the five children done across his upper back. In an emotional moment, he also told the jury he had had his pool removed because he couldn't bear to look at it, thinking of the memories of his grandchildren swimming in it. Later in testimony, when asked if he wanted his son to be put to death, he asked the jury for mercy. This is a story that's so horrifying, it's almost unimaginable. It's the story of five children who were hurt and betrayed by the one person they were supposed to be able to trust to protect them, their own father. But let's start at the beginning. This is Timothy Jones Jr. He married a woman named Amber Kaiser when he was 22 and she was just 18 years old. At first, things between them were pretty good. Can you tell the jury a little bit about your and Tim's relationship? Um, in the beginning, Tim and I had a very strong relationship. I, I think we found a lot in common. Um, I wasn't speaking to my family at the time. You know, I'm not sure if he was really speaking to his at the time when we first met. And we just kind of latched onto each other. Timothy and Amber moved into a trailer in Kentucky and had five children together. Their names were Nathan, Mara, Gabriel, Elias, and Elaine Murray. Despite things being good with the family initially, the relationship between Timothy and Amber would later begin to crumble. Any little thing would, would kind of spark an argument, and our relationship became volatile, uh, not just on Tim's side, on mine as well. Um, it got aggressive at times, violent. Um, yeah, but we, we managed to stick through it uh, because we had the children. Um, towards the end of our marriage, I think I was thinking in the best interest for my children that it was not a good environment. It was not something that children need to be seeing. So Amber and Timothy would eventually decide to separate in May of 2012. They agreed to co-parent together. Amber would later say that she had no reason to think her children would not be safe with their father, as he had never displayed abusive characteristics in the past. I trusted my husband at the time, because he gave me no reason not to with my children. He was a good father while we were married. He promised to take care of them. Um, we co-parented pretty good towards the end. Um, I think that's what took me back a little bit. But two weeks into the separation, Timothy would return to the home he once shared with the rest of his family members and found out that his wife was allegedly having an affair with a 19-year-old neighbor and would go to see him after putting the children to bed. Tim, I'm not, I'm not calling to argue or anything. I just... So, like, the past two or three phone calls, you've been, like, really on the edge and um, angry or, like, I don't, even, I don't know how to explain. You saying you're, like, coming off really frustrated or whatever, and I was just concerned about you, so. Joy Lorick was the babysitter that Timothy hired to come to the house and care for the children from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. She would later testify about the deplorable conditions that existed inside of the home. And what was, what was the condition of the house? When you um, it would be like dishes, clothes everywhere, trash overflowing. Uh, were there bugs? Oh yeah, there was like a few roaches. Not only was the house dirty, but on most occasions, the children were fed very little. 
This must have taken such a toll on their young, growing bodies. Did you have some concerns about uh, what the children, whether or not they were getting enough to eat? Yes. And, and why was that? Um, it was like when he would like <sighs> McDonald's, like it would be like only one to 20 piece nugget with two large fries and you know, they would have to share that. But McDonald's was actually a rare treat for these children because when they were at home, they were fed a lot less. Joy was only given oatmeal to feed them on most days, she explained. Me being at the house and feeding the kids oatmeal all day, it wouldn't really be nothing. I probably remember one time he came back with a little Caesar's pizza. It was like only one box of little Caesar's pizza. <coughs> but other than that, that's what I fed the kids all day is oatmeal. It was not only inadequate meals that the kids were forced to endure, but it was physical abuse at the hands of their own father. Joy testified about how on one occasion they had been traveling and Timothy had left her with the children while he went across the street to go to the bar. At some point, Nathan and Gabe began yelling and squealing loudly. Joy told them both to settle down, but they didn't. Timothy ended up hearing this interaction and when he returned home and punished them severely right in front of Joy. I know I just heard her tell y'all to stop, y'all didn't. And he pulled down both their pants and spanked them on the belt. Um, and that was in front of you? Yes. Joy tried to get help for the children by calling social services, but she says they did nothing. And she just basically asked me how I was doing and I got to talking and when I talk, I just start ramming it on. And I started talking about Mira and them and the stuff that I felt, you know, that I knew they was going through. And I was like, I feel like if I make that call to DSS, there's nothing going to be done. And she said, well, we're going to make this call together. And I said, okay. And that's the second what they did. They did not. When Joy called DSS, she told them that Timothy was using a belt on his children and that they weren't being fed enough. She talked about the abuse and how the only thing he gave her to feed them for the entire day was oatmeal. It's not clear whether social services didn't take the allegations seriously or just chose to step in and do nothing. If they had, things could have been much different. Timothy might not have recognized how wonderful his children were or appreciated them, but there were people in their lives that certainly did, including their teachers. Jacqueline Morin was Eli's kindergarten teacher. When she took the stand, it was clear how much she had loved him. And I became very close to him. Um, he, he would gravitate to the front of the carpet. Um, he was smaller, so he, at the beginning of the year, was at the front of the carpet so he could see. But as the year progressed, he, he, he wanted to stay. Um, oftentimes when I would teach at the front, he'd be right in front of me. <laughs> Um, he was one of the kids that would want to sit with me at lunch. It was special. Eli was the kind of kid that all his classmates liked and wanted to be with. He was kind and helped other students with their reading, as you can see in this picture. One thing I'll never forget about Ms. Moran, I'm sorry, is she's the best teacher ever. I wish I had Ms. Moran to teach next year. My teacher made me smile by the door when we would be shaking hands. One of Nathan's teachers also came forward to talk about how wonderful a child he was, but this teacher would also describe his inklings that there was something more going on beneath the surface with this little boy. Nakan was the type of person that would always smile, but towards the, uh, the middle of the school year, I sensed that sometimes he would smile, but he was not actually happy. He would just put on that smile because he wanted people to think that he was happy. Uh, very emotional. Sometimes, like I said, he would come in and you would just have to give him a hug. Uh, and you'd have to reassure him that there was a safe place to be. It was clear that Eli, Nathan, and the other children loved going to school, but they would not have the opportunity to complete their next year. On August 28th of 2014, Timothy picked them up from school and daycare. This would be the last day that the children would be seen alive. By September 2nd, the children were still absent at school. The following day, their mother had learned of their absence and reported them as missing. Police were able to get in contact with the neighbors of the family, who said that Timothy told them he and his children were moving out of the state. He had not said this to his children's mother, who now had no idea where her kids could be. 
On September 6th, Timothy was arrested at a driver's license checkpoint. Officers could smell chemicals from inside of his car. Officers also found what appeared to be bleach, blood, and possible body fluids in the car. Officers say they also got a hit on the missing persons report filed earlier. At this point, things are not looking good for the children. Police interrogate him and he offers an explanation for what he says happened to Nathan. He said he was very angry with the child for messing with the outlets in the home. I was contacted on Sunday, uh, September 7th. We were going to drive out to Mississippi and attempt to interview Timothy Jones. All right, can, can you walk us through what happened? I questioned the town about four outlets that he blew. After a series of not getting any favorable responses out of him, I tried to use more harsh measures to just try to get out of him what was going on because I didn't know what he was doing. Tim would then tell the police that he proceeded to force his young son to go through rigorous exercise for an extended period of time and cracked him with a belt on the backside. After forcing his son through this horrific abuse, he says he then told him to go to bed. And then, and then you, you find out what? I come back and find out that he's deceased. And when I find out he's deceased, then the shit is the fan and all. Instead of calling for help in case Nathan could have been revived, Timothy decided that the best course of action would be to wipe out his remaining children. His confession, which was recorded, was played aloud in court. Timothy could be seen wiping his eyes with a handkerchief as he listened to it. So, Natan was, was dead, and then what happened? And I followed suit with the other four. And how did, how did you so kill that him? that was with my hands. With your hands? Can you describe what you mean by with your hands? Around their neck. Around their neck? Okay. <laughs> After killing six-year-old Nathan, he would then kill seven-year-old Eli, eight-year-old Mara, two-year-old Gabe, and one-year-old Elaine. At that point, he was, as described, running on fear. He decided to go on the run. I took the coward route and started following those voices in my head. He put the bodies in bags and then loaded them into his car. He was running through ideas of what he was going to do to get rid of the bodies. Do you remember what... Step one was you know, like or something like that. I was gonna come up and do you're gonna I was gonna do all kinds of stuff. But he wasn't able to bring himself to actually cut up the bodies. He stopped at Walmart to get several things, including saws and acid. He used air freshener to mask the scent of the bodies that were decomposing in the car. And then he hit an obstacle. I pulled off to the side at somebody's house to try to collect myself to see where I was at. Yeah. And in the process of pulling back onto the road, I got stuck in a ditch. You got stuck, and what happened? The tow truck had to come on. He called a wrecker. At around this time, he was stopped by a police officer for a routine checkpoint, and it was determined that he was the father of five children that were missing. It was at that point that he was arrested. He had already dumped the bodies of the children, which were later located in trash bags on a rural dirt road in Alabama. It's impossible to imagine being Amber, the mother of these five children. She had all five of her children taken from her all at once. These are the screams of a woman who lost each and every one of her beloved children. <laughs> While people in the courtroom could be seen wiping their eyes and the sounds of her anguished cries, Timothy appeared stone-faced and unemotional. She expressed the rage she felt when she testified in court. It's a, it's a really hard, I hear what my kids went through, and I'm just being honest. I hear what my kids went through and what they endured. Sorry. And as a mother, if I could personally rip his face off, I would. That's that's the mom in me. That's, that's the mama bear in me wanting to just make him feel everything they felt. Despite the rage she felt, she didn't want any more death to occur, even the death of the person that did this to her children. I can't bring myself to want anybody to die. That's, that's something that I say because I have to be okay with what I... I 
say on this stand. I have to, this is something I have to live with. Amber went on to say that despite the terrible things he did to her children, those children still loved their father and they wouldn't want him to die. She felt she needed to speak on behalf of them and not on behalf of herself. And I don't say it lightly. Um, he did not show my children mercy by any means. But my kids loved him. And if I'm speaking on behalf of my kids and not myself, that's what I would have to say. I'm not here for me. The mom in me just wants him to feel it. Everything that I feel, that my kids felt. Nothing justifies, nothing justifies what you've done. There, there's nothing you could possibly say that would justify what you've done to my babies. Timothy's father would also take the stand to testify and ask for mercy for his son who killed his beloved grandchildren. It was clear in his eyes how heartbroken he was, even though his son hurt him in the most unimaginable way. He still had the unconditional love for them that a father has for his sons. This is not the type of love and compassion Timothy had for his own children. Do you love Tim? More than anything. But he still acknowledged what his son had done. This one night in August 2014, he made a choice. Take away all those babies from everybody, including you. Yes. Perhaps one of the most heartbreaking parts of the testimony of Timothy's father was when he said that he blamed himself for what Timothy did to those children. Yeah, I blame myself more than him. I know you did, but you know he's the one. I know if I'd have been there, maybe this wouldn't happen. But at the end of the day, there is only one person that is responsible for the deaths of these five innocent little children. And that's Timothy. Now, with all the information on the table and the recommendations from family members, it was up to a jury to decide whether to sentence Timothy Jones Jr. to a life behind bars without parole or death for the murders of his five children. As to indictment 2015 GS3201880189 0190 0191 0195 the state versus timothy ray jones jr we the jury unanimously agree on the existence of an aggravating circumstance two or more persons were murdered by the defendant by act or pursuant to one scheme or course of conduct timothy remained stoic as the verdict was read we, the jury, in the above entitled case, have found beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following statutory aggravating circumstances. To wit, two or more persons were murdered by the defendant by act or pursuant to one scheme or course of conduct, and the murder of five children 11 years of age or younger. Now I recommend to the court that the defendant, Timothy R. Jones, Jr., <coughs> be sentenced to death. To death. He later filed an appeal, which was rejected in late March of 2023. He will remain behind bars until his execution day, which is not yet set. Do you think he deserves the death penalty or would life in prison have been more justified? Let us know in the comments. New at six o'clock exactly one week ago, Tiffany Moss was found guilty of killing her stepdaughter. And tonight, we are hearing emotional reaction from the child's grandmother. Certainly are. She fought, but she failed to gain custody of 10-year-old Imani Moss. Emini Gabrielle Moss was born on April 23rd of 2003. Her mother struggled with a drug problem and would eventually give her parental rights over to her father, Iman. Iman took Amani to a local church where he met a preschool teacher named Tiffany Moss. The two began dating and ended up having two children together. While Tiffany properly cared for her two birth children, she couldn't be bothered with Amani, 
whom she routinely abused. Iman was rarely home, but was aware of what was going on and didn't stop it. The abuse ultimately cost Tiffany her job when Imani was six. The little girl told the school nurse that Tiffany beat her with a curtain rod. She was arrested, but only sentenced to five years of probation and no jail time. After her arrest, Imani was sent to live with her grandmother, Robin, for about six months. Now, her schoolwork began to improve, but Iman fought for custody of Imani and won, which required the little girl to return to her abusers. Throughout the years, she tried to run away from home multiple times. On one occasion, she told a police officer that she wanted to run away because her stepmother was mean to her. A report was filed, but she was never rescued from Tiffany. Imani's one place of solitude and safety was school, where her former teacher said she was a model little student. Uh, Imani's behavior in your classroom, um, was she ever disrespectful? in your classroom? Never. Okay. Um, what about her um, uh, obedience to you, in other words? Was she ever defiant or disobedient where you had to take um, disciplinary action? No, the only, uh, she was precious. It was a blessing to have her in my classroom. She, um, the only issue we had was uh, having her homework completed on a regular basis. We now know that the reason Imani was having trouble getting her homework done on time was likely due to the horrific living conditions and deplorable abuse she was suffering at home. Poor Imani was also terrified of getting into trouble and on one occasion cried when her teacher went to write something on her behavior sheet. She must have known the abuse would be worse if she went home with that note. Her teacher explained that Imani was a kind soul who was nice to everyone even a bully. She was a wonderful friend to every student, even a bully that she tried so hard to be friends with on a daily basis. Um, one time she wrote a letter to me and to the bully and said, let's just be friends, let's forget about what happened. How could someone hurt any child, especially one with a heart as pure as Imani's clearly was? Her teacher became emotional and reached for a tissue after being shown pictures of Imani taken while she had been at school. Imani's place of safety would be taken away from her when she was pulled out of school for homeschooling. Around this time, she was kept in one room of the apartment, regularly abused and starved. All the while, Tiffany and her birth children ate and enjoyed life. Her last moments of life were pure torture as she slowly starved to death and was given not one ounce of love or care. On October 10th of 2013, she was fatigued. She was starving. She was probably having difficulty walking but she's searching for food, maybe if you believe that one. But what does the defendant do? She puts a little owl on her legs and puts her back in the room. That's what she put in the text message. I'll rub some owl on her legs and put her back in the room. By October 28th, the little girl had died. While Iman wanted to call the police, Tiffany convinced him to help her cover up the murder instead. They her body and later placed it in a trash can. Both Iman and Tiffany would later be arrested. As the prosecutor would later point out, Tiffany looked for any excuse possible to torture poor little Imani throughout her young life. And as you recall the testimony from Detective King, when she told you that when she talked to Imani and she spoke to her to find out how she had gotten those bruises, it was because she was told to do her homework by this defendant and that she had five minutes to do her homework and that when she didn't get it done, that she got, that she got. This was a very rough trial for everyone involved and the graphic details were enough to make the members of the jury openly cry. There were details about the case that jurors were hearing for the very first time, like the process of the autopsy and what the medical examiner actually found. Some of those details are simply too graphic to share on air, and they certainly evoked emotion with a lot of the jurors and mostly everyone inside the courtroom. Tiffany was not the least bit affected by Imani's death and simply went out to replace the sheets the little girl died on. And the next day after she died, Tiffany went and bought new sheets uh, for that bed and kept the bed and made the bed up. Finally, 
justice would be served for this little girl. This is the jury's verdict in case 18B 1541-1, State of Georgia versus Tiffany Nicole Moss. Count one, findings of jury as to alleged statutory aggravating circumstances. We, the jury, find beyond a reasonable doubt that the offense of murder as alleged in count one was outrageously or wantonly vile, horrible, or inhuman in that it involved torture of the victim before death. Tiffany was guilty of an incredibly heinous crime, and now her life lay in the jury's hands. Would she receive life in prison without parole or death? We, the jury, recommend and fix the penalty as death, signed and dated by the foreperson. Tiffany remained stone-faced as she was sentenced to death. When given the opportunity to say something, she declined. With respect to count one, ma'am, I impose the sentence of death. Tiffany remains behind bars, where she will remain until she is executed. Imani's grandmother, Robin, says this all could have been prevented if social services had done their job and granted her custody of Imani after the first signs of abuse. If they would have did their job, when she got the first time, that's sign number one. Ran away, sign number two, ran away again, sign number three. I mean, how many signs do you have to have? Serial killer Anthony Kirkland now officially sentenced to die. The judge agreed with the jury's recommendation. Today, the victim's families had their chance to speak with a man who murdered their loved ones. This is a young child we're talking about here. You want to play like games? I'm not playing no game with you, man. It was March 7th of 2009, and in Cincinnati, Ohio, Esme Kenny, a 13-year-old girl, decided to go for a jog. Unfortunately, she would never come home. She was declared a missing person, and the police decided to search the nearby forest. It was there that they discovered this man, Anthony Kirkland, sitting by a tree. Due to the suspicious circumstances, he was taken in for questioning. Are you aware that there was a child reported missing? Did any officer talk to you about, about that when they brought me down here? Anthony denied seeing Esme in the woods, but when they searched him, they found knives and Esme's iPod and watch. Now confronted with this information, he eventually admitted that he did see her that day. She accidentally ran into him. She was about to me a watch. Okay. And then what happened? I saw my son's mother. What, what did you do then? He would then describe the horrible things he did to this young girl. Anthony tells the officer that he believed that Esme was beaten up but still alive. But the tragic news would soon come to light. Esme had been found and she was dead. She was nude, except for tennis shoes on her feet. Esme's clothes had been twisted and used to strangle her. Why did Anthony feel the need to hurt this young girl who had done nothing more than accidentally bump into him? What made you kill her? Hearing dumb sorry for the time she was a just like the other woman that could destroy my life. Police began to wonder if Anthony could have other victims. They were especially interested about whether he could have been connected to the murder of 14-year-old Cassania Crawford and 45-year-old Mary Jo Newton, who both died in the spring of 2006. He would explain that he dated Mary Jo, but that they got in an argument involving money and it became physical. And she told me that that would probably be a good thing. And what of young Cassania, whose body has been found in the woods? Anthony said that they randomly met by a high school. He explained what he did to this poor girl. But the murder spree didn't end there. He would also confess to the murder of Kimya Rollison, who was 25 years old. She was a sex worker and he killed her after they got into an argument after he paid her for sex. Where did you hit him? In the throat. And where did she wear her throat? From the, to the gentleman. I told her to blow his cover out with blood was coming up. It was coming up too fast, too quick. 
They just told me she couldn't feel her legs. So now we know that Anthony Kirkland was behind four different murders. But what would you say if I told you that he had actually been imprisoned for murder before this? That's right. In 1987, he murdered his girlfriend, Leola Douglas, after she said she didn't want to have relations with him. He spent only 16 years in prison and then was released to kill some more, which he did. Now Anthony had already confessed to the murders, so it wasn't a matter of having to prove his guilt. The matter at hand was whether he would be sentenced to life in prison with no parole or sentenced to death. The jury recommended death and the judge upheld their decision. Finally, the family members of those affected by this trial had the chance to speak. Arlene Lee, the grandmother of one of the victims, spoke out in court. Her father is devastated. He cannot and will not look you in your face. And you should be really grateful for that. Phyllis Lee, the aunt of one of the victims, also spoke out about how she wished Anthony would die if it was up to her. I want you to die slowly, but it's not going to happen. They go put that needle in you and you go go quick, but you tortured them children. You tortured everybody. But the story didn't end there. Anthony tried to appeal his death sentence several times over the years. In July of 2018, he was granted a new resentencing hearing. It was up to the jury to decide whether he should remain on death row or if his sentence would be changed to life in prison. You will now hear your verdicts read for the record. State of Ohio versus Anthony Kirkland, case number P0901629, Judge Nickelocker, verdict count two. We the jury, being duly impaneled and sworn, do hereby find by proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the aggravating circumstances that the defendant was found guilty of committing do outweigh the mitigating factors presented in the case regarding the aggravated murder of Cassandra Crawford. We therefore unanimously find that the sentence of death should be imposed upon Anthony Kirkland. That was the nail in the coffin for Anthony, who will remain on death row until his time of execution. He is 54 and still alive. I've tried four serial killers in my life. He is the worst of the worst, and he cannot be he cannot be killed by the state of Ohio soon enough for me. So there we have it. Three stories of horrific murderers getting death sentences while the world watched on. May all of their victims rest in peace.